So in that case, let's get started. And yeah, and I've been researching in this field for about over 20 years now. And one of the things, that, the main thing we will talk about today is we'll talk about the process of adapting to exercise in the heat and specifically the process of heat adaptation. We will, I won't kind of spend time trying to convince you that heat is going to be a problem. I, I think you can all, all believe that, especially when it comes to Tokyo, it is going to be very hot, it's going to be very humid, and that it's going to be a real challenge to our ability to perform. So I will go right into what can we do about it, and especially trying to get ready for competi competing in the heat. So what we will try to cover today is, first off, the idea of adapting your body to heat as an athlete. First, does it work? And second, what are some of the main physiological changes that happen as you become adapted to heat? And then third, we will talk about the process of decaying and reinducing heat. What happens if you, for example, are adapted the athlete and now you want to really taper and prepare for competition you don't want the added heat stress what is the risk of losing that heat adaptation and what is the process of, of regaining that heat adaptation once you are heat adapted we'll also talk about whether we can use heat adaptation as an ergogenic aid for when we are competing in a thermal neutral environment so can we use heat the same way we use altitude, that we go up to altitude, we improve our performance at sea level. Can we do the same with heat? Can we adapt ourselves to the heat and then improve our performance in a more temperate environment? And then the final question is, what, how can we best adapt our athletes? And for example, if we know we're going to be competing in Tokyo where it's hot and humid and yet we don't necessarily have access to that same hot and humid environment, if obviously in Finland you folks love your sauna, uh, you know, can you adapt in a different kind of environment, a hot and dry environment? and still get the benefits for a, a hot and humid environment like Tokyo. So some of the things we'll cover, we'll, we'll try to cover that in this talk. This first slide is from a comprehensive physiology review by Nigel Taylor in 2011. And I can make available all of these references. I'll send them to RE to distribute later. Uh, the main thing I want to demonstrate with this slide is that we'll be talking about very basic physiological changes such as changes in core temperature, changes in heart rate during exercise, changes in sweat rate. And it sounds simple, but underlying the physiology is very complex. There is a whole lot of different systems that are being affected from our, our uh, horm hormonal systems, our fluid balance, our, um, our adrenal cortex, and all of our barrel receptor responses, our plasma volume. There is a lot of changes in the body. So even though we're going to try to break it down into very simple major changes like core temperature, heart rate, sweat rate. Just, I just want to show with this slide that there is a lot of different systems involved to make those changes happen. And again, I will make available the list of references and I can send most of these papers over to Ari to distribute to you to uh, take a look at. So, the other thing to realize before we talk about heat adaptation is some of the terminology and some of the methods in order to adapt this to heat. So 
we often talk about heat acclimation or heat acclimatization and many of the times we use those terms as as the same word but they mean slightly different things so heat acclimation is an artificial setting so if you are you know, sitting in a sauna if you are exercising for an hour a day in a heat chamber that is an artificial environment and that is termed heat acclimation heat acclimatization is if we actually have a training camp in the heat if we go to the desert and train if we go to tokyo ahead of time and adapt ourselves to the environment and be in that natural environment that is known as heat acclimatization so i just we'll still kind of use the terms interchangeably. I'm mainly going to use the term heat adaptation, but I just want to make sure everyone recognizes that the terms mean slightly different things when we say acclimation or acclimatization. And then there is a third term that is not in here in terms of different types of adaptation, and that is habituation. Habituation is more the psychological changes, our improved kind of tolerance, psychological tolerance to heat or to an environmental stress. So there's habituation and acclimatization or acclimation. The two of them together form adaptation. So that's just some of the terminology. What we have in this slide is, I'll, different methods of either adapt of adapting yourself to heat and we'll be talking about some of these different processes throughout but the main thing is i want to recognize that there are more than one way to adapt to an environment we can for example have a constant work rate of exercise where we tell everyone you are going to be running at this particular pace and that is co a constant work rate just like if we towed cyclists riding a indoor bike or on their outdoor bike to ride at 150 watts that is a constant work rate as opposed to a self-paced exercise where we tell them to you know work at a set ratings of perceived exertion. You know, ride at a fairly hard intensity, but you know, an RPE of maybe 13 out of six to 20 scale. Um, so those are different ways. You can set the workload or you can tell them to set kind of their effort based on how they feel or in a controlled intensity by their a set heart rate so let's say you want them to ride at 145 beats per minute or run at that effort so those are different ways in which you can adapt individuals you can tell them to work at a constant rate or work at a rate based on their perception or on heart rate the other way is a controlled hyperthermia and this is mostly in the lab that we would do we would tell them to, to uh, exercise and then we would set, once their core temperature reaches a set heart rate or a set, set degree Celsius, we would then adjust the workload so that they maintain that core temperature for another hour or so. So this slide is really to demonstrate different ways in which we can adapt an individual. So let's now take a look at some of the major changes that happen. In 2016, my colleague Chris Tyler and I did a meta-analysis of over 90 studies that used heat adaptation. And what we wanted to look at was just how much adaptation is possible. Does it actually improve performance? The other major question we had was, what is the minimum dose? What is how much heat adaptation is required to actually improve performance? And 
do we need to have very long programs or can we get away with very short programs? So two slides ago, we talked about different ways of adaptation. So this is, we examined about 90 studies and we found different methods of heat adaptation. Most of them were in a controlled setting, so they again had them exercise at let's say 145 beats per minute over two weeks in the heat. We broke it down into different durations. Anything under seven days, we term short-term heat adaptation or STHA, and the the brackets means the number of studies and the number of participants. So in this example, there are 26 studies that had short-term heat adaptation, and overall there were 274 participants. Then we had medium term, so anything between one to two weeks, eight to 14 days. And then we had long-term adaptation of over two weeks. We found just under a thousand total participants in all of these studies. We only had 8% of the participants be females. So there's still a lot of work that needs to be understood with how females adapt to heat. Do they adapt same at the same rate, same magnitude as men? What are the impact of the menstrual cycle on these changes or also with, uh, with oral contraceptives on heat adaptation. That's really still quite unknown. So we looked at whether the changes were trivial, small, moderate, or very, or large. So the challenge with any heat adaptation study is that there is a lack of blinding. Participants know whether they are in a hot environment or not. It's very hard to fool them and really truly blind the participants. And the other challenge with most of these studies is many of them, especially the ones in the earlier, in the 60s and in the 50s, had, had no control groups. So uh, we, they, that is one limitation of many of these studies. So the most important thing is what did we find? Did we actually improve performance? And in the overwhelming majority, we did see an improvement of performance. This kind of plot is called a forest plot. So here is zero if there is no effect. If it is negative, then it's showing kind of that there would be a negative performance effect. And if it is above zero, it is showing that there is a positive or a benefit in terms of performance. And what we have broken down is short term, medium term, long term heat adaptation, and also like all grouping them all together. So as we can see from this slide, it is overwhelmingly positive that heat adaptation improved performance. And these range from a time to exhaustion where we had individuals run for as long as they can at a set pace until they couldn't run any longer, or it was a time trial type of effort, such as a five kilometer run or a 15 kilometer time trial. Out of the 48 studies that had a performance measure, we found 43% or 43 of them had at least 1% improvement in the overall performance. The mean was much higher. It was a mean of 16% improvement. The median was 8%. So again, overwhelmingly, the data suggests that heat adapted individuals perform much better in hot environments. We found in terms of breaking down short term, medium term, and long term, that even short term of four to five days of exposure to exercise in the heat beforehand still had a benefit. And however, the longer you can do it, the more benefit you're gonna see. So you can see a little bit to start with, and there is already significant improvement, but the longer you can 
adapt in the heat, the better. We found that the best method was this self-paced method where we told them to, or the, the scientists told them to run or exercise at a set rate of perceived exertion. And that seems to be because as they keep exercising and improving their tolerance to heat, they, re they naturally increase their workload to match. Whereas if you were telling them to run at a set pace and you kept that same pace over two weeks, the second week they're going to be more adapted, more fit, so they're actually getting less stimulus in the second week. So you have to make sure that you adjust their exercise intensity throughout heat adaptation or else you're not going to see a progression of performance and improvement. Okay, so the main thing is that performance does benefit. Now let's break it down into what happens in terms of major physiology. This is now looking at core temperature. So if it is negative, it is showing that there is a lower core temperature. So that is one of the classic responses to Heat adaptation is that you have a lower resting core temperature, and this is really supported by all of these studies. We found about a 0.16 degree lower resting core temperature in individuals after they were heat adapted. During exercise, that improvement was actually quite a bit more. It was at about 0.35 degrees Celsius lower average core temperature over exercise in the heat. So they were much less thermally stressed. And, and uh, ISO time means we, if we looked at 30 minutes into exercise for both the heat adapted, uh, for the heat adapted individual uh, before and after, there was still a, a very large improvement in core temperature. In this case, again, the same message as with performance, a short-term heat adaptation already improved your core temperature at about the same as a two-week period. But if you were able to extend that, that adaptation into a longer time frame, into over two weeks, you got more benefit in core temperature. However, there's only one study that had this. So we're still not really sure. The same trends happen with skin temperature, that there is a decrease during exercise. So you have much less thermal stress after you become heat adapted during exercise. The other classic response is heart rate and that we have a lower resting heart rate and a lower exercise heart rate. And this is borne out in the data. We have about a five beats per minute lower resting heart rate. We also have a very large decrease in heart rate during exercise of about 12 to 16 beats per minute. Same idea that even four to five days of adaptation was already sufficient to get you most of these benefits, that the four to five days was quite similar to uh, a two-week exposure, but again, a long-term, more than two-week exposure is going to be a benefit. It's going to get you more improvement. We didn't really find any changes in blood pressure, stroke volume, or overall cardiac output, but again, there were relatively few studies that measured this. So the main message again is heart rate also improves. You have less kind of cardiovascular strain, less thermal strain after heat adaptation. The third classic adaptation response that you will see is a greater sweat rate after being adapted to the heat. So we saw a large increase in total sweat rate of about 19%. And this was both you started sweating at a lower heart rate, or sorry, lower core temperature. You also had a greater increase in the rate of sweating. So you, you started sweating earlier and you also responded 
more sensitively with greater sweat rate to a thermal challenge. This story is different in that short term heat adaptation isn't overly effective. You really need about two weeks of adaptation to really drive the sweating response. So four to five days, you're going to get cardiovascular and you're going to get core temperature improvements, but you're not really going to get sweat rate improvements. The main change that seems to come about is that there is an increase in your resting plasma volume that allows you to sweat more, allows you to have a lower heart rate. The other change is that there is a decrease in thirst sensation and also your voluntary fluid consumption. So even if you normally allow athletes to drink the thirst, once they're heat adapted, this is the time where you may want to implement a drinking schedule because you can't rely on their thirst to be as kind of a, as good a match to their fluid needs after they become heat adapted because they're less thirsty yet they are sweating more. The final change is perception. There's relatively few studies looking at our perceived tolerance to heat stress but the ones that are there demonstrate that work feels less challenging once we are adapted to heat. There has been no studies looking at heat adaptation and its effect on actual decision making and cognitive function. So that is unknown right now. Okay, so let's take a practical example of how heat adaptation might work. This was a study between uh, Danish researchers and Qatari researchers. And what they did was they took trained very elite Danish cyclists. They tested them in Denmark before and after a two weeks of training in Qatar. So they were looking at the rate of heat adaptation. So what they had was they had trained Danish cyclists. They did a outdoor time trial of over 40 kilometers in Denmark. And at that time it was five degrees Celsius the athletes averaged 300 watts, so they were quite fit and strong. They then took them to two weeks in Qatar, and then they tested them in a similar circuit of distance. Obviously, it's a completely different environment, but they tested them right after arrival, about a week into their camp and at the end of two weeks. So at one, six, and 13 days into the camp, and this is their power output. What we have is, this is 100% of their normal performance in Denmark. So on the day one, you see a real drop in their power output and in their overall performance, being at about a 15% decrement compared to their uh, normal levels in, in Denmark. After a week, they improved the performance by about 14%, so now they were at about 92% of their normal capacity back in Denmark. And then at the end of two weeks, they were at about 97% of their normal capacity. They had almost regained their capacity as if they were back in Denmark. So it shows that two weeks of adaptation in these very trained cyclists was able to adapt the performance and improve it significantly over the course of time. And however, the important thing to demonstrate is that they never improved their performance above what they were able to do in a cooler environment before this heat camp. So this demonstrates that yes, you can adapt the heat, but heat is still going to be a factor. Heat, you're still not going to improve your performance more in a very, very hot environment compared to doing it in a cooler environment. So if you are going to try to set a world record, you are not going to try to do it in a very, very hot environment uh, unless you are very well adapted to it. So the interesting thing was we've demonstrated with the, that first 
part of the study that they improved their performance over two weeks and they got it back to about 100% of their normal capacity. I said earlier, one interesting question is, can you use heat adaptation as an ergogenic aid for if you are competing in a thermal neutral environment? So, you know, again, the analogy is like with altitude training. Can we go train at altitude and come back and improve our performance at sea level. So what they did was they had, they brought the, these cyclists back to Denmark, had them redo the time trial, and they also had a control group that stayed in Denmark and did their normal training and tested them again afterwards. So this first graph is their VO2 max data and what they showed was that in both the control group and in the heat adaptation group, there was no change before or after those two weeks. So the heat adapted group had absolutely no change in their VO2 max after uh, when they came back to Denmark in a cooler environment. More importantly, what happened in the time trial when they came back and did it? It was in a 13 degrees time um, Celsius and the control group that stayed in Denmark had no change in terms of their wattage and the heat adapted group also had no change when they came back. So even though their performance in the heat improved, when they came back in a less hot environment, they had no benefit. So this would suggest that heat adaptation is specific to exercise and the heat itself. However, you know, so it would suggest that there's no point in going to exercise in the heat if you are competing in a neutral environment. However, the thing to remember is that these Danish cyclists, when they came back, also did not do worse. It wasn't as if they came back and performed worse in the in a, a neutral environment. So it would suggest that even in the worst case, all you have done is taken them away for two weeks in the heat. And that if you are trying to guess whether you're going to compete in a hot environment and whether the weather is actually going to be hot or not, it might still be a good insurance to adapt them to heat because at worst case, you're not doing any harm to the athlete. Another interesting study that came earlier was an actual lab-based study looking at heat adaptation and then exercise in a neutral environment. And this study was exercising in 40 degrees Celsius and 30% re relative humidity. And then at the end, they were exercising in a neutral environment. So they were doing a time trial. And what they showed, the control group had no effect but the time trial or the heat adaptation group, they all improved their performance in both a cool and in a hot environment. So this study by Lorenzo et al. from University of Oregon in a lab setting, not in a field setting, would suggest that there is a benefit to heat adaptation to exercise in, the cool, in a cooler environment. So combining the two data, sets, I would suggest that, you know, if you, if we're going to Tokyo, we know it's going to be hot and humid, but even on the chance that it isn't going to be hot and humid on that day, it still might be benefit to adapt your, your uh, athletes to the heat just for the potential for a performance effect. Worst case, you're not going to be hurting the athletes. So if that's the case, if we've adapted individuals and now we want to not stress the athletes with heat, we're in a tapering phase, how quickly does heat adaptation decay? And this meta-analysis by Hein Donen in the Netherlands found about nine studies that looked at this process of heat decay. And overall, they found with core temperature, 
and with heart rate, they found about a two and a half percent loss of that heat adaptation status over the course of a, a day. So this would suggest that if you have really well adapted athletes, you're going to lose about two and a half percent. So about two weeks or so, you're going to lose most of the benefits of of um, the heat adaptation and over a course of a month you're going to lose all of it. The good news is you can maintain that state of heat adaptation and you don't need to do it by having your athletes stressed every day during again let's say this two-week tapering phase. The data suggests that you can maintain that state of heat adaptation with one dose of heat stress every four to five days. So you don't need to stress your athletes with heat every day during the tapering phase, but maybe every four to five days, just have them expose the heat a little bit. And however, there were no studies that actually looked at performance effects. They were only looking at the core and heart rate responses. So overall, in terms of summarizing heat adaptation, it is possible that there is a physiological benefit. There is also a performance benefit. And this graph is demonstrating that there is a difference in terms of different systems in the body and the rate at which they improve. So we see mainly that sweating rate in the gray takes a lot longer time to adapt than something like heart rate, which drops quite quickly over the course of a week. Sweat rate might take, again, over two weeks to really adapt. There does seem to be that dose-dependent response that I mentioned. However, the good news is for performance and for most physiology, even a short four to five day program seems to get you most of the benefits already. Again, heat adaptation doesn't seem to impact neutral. At worst, it, at best, it might improve performance. At worst, it doesn't seem to impair performance. So other strategies or tactics to use with heat adaptation. We'll go over these somewhat quickly. If you don't have adaptation, the capacity for exercising in an environmental chamber or setting up a bike in a sauna. The other thing you can do is to wear a lot of clothing. So as an example, a runner, you can have people run or bike in a lot more winter clothing, even in kind of a moderate conditions than they normally would. So this data just shows that your core temperature with winter and rain gear is a lot higher than if you exercise with normal kind of uh, shorts and t-shirt and so you can get some of the benefits of increasing your body temperature just by using clothing okay so you're not going to get all of the way there but this is a way that you can do if you don't have access to heat facilities to exercise in Another interesting angle that has been explored is the process of using both dehydration and also heat adaptation to synergistically to combine the responses to maybe improve the rate of heat adaptation. This is still somewhat controversial, but the idea in terms of does it work or not, but the idea is to is to, uh, while the athletes are exercising in the heat to adapt the heat, they are not drinking or they're drinking much less than normal and so that they are slightly dehydrated. You would still rehydrate them afterwards, but the idea is that the combined dehydration stress and also the heat adaptation stress is gonna improve the rate of heat adaptation. So I won't really go over the data, but the idea is out there. There are still studies kind of testing and showing whether it works or not. 
And the ideas right now is about split in the middle of whether it is a benefit or not. But this might be a strategy to accelerate the rate of heat adaptation by, again, having the athletes not hydrate as much during exercise. You would still rehydrate them as best as you can after exercise. So the other thing you can do is just to have passive exposure, whether in a sauna or in a hot tub. So you can do this before exercise or after exercise. There is relatively little performance data on how beneficial passive adaptation is. But the main point of heat adaptation is really to drive your temperature up and to maintain a higher than normal core temperature for about an hour to 90 minutes a day. So whether you do that by exercise, by exercise in a hot environment, by wearing a lot of clothing or passive exposure doesn't seem to matter as long as you can get the, the core temperature high. The main way that passive exposures is used now by athletes is to be using them after exercise, whether in a sauna or whether in hot water immersion. So the idea is that they would exercise and they would perform kind of to their normal capacity. And now after exercise, their core temperature is already higher than normal. And now you're gonna put them in a hot tub or in a sauna for 30 to 60 minutes to keep that core temperature higher than normal. So it seems to be much more effective to do this after exercise than before exercise. So there's been a number of studies suggesting that this method of post-exercise passive exposure to heat is a beneficial way to really kind of uh, easily implement heat training for athletes. And again, if you don't have exposure to exercise in a hot environment, this could be a very effective way. And we find similar ways of decreasing the uh, core temperature, decreasing the, and the time to complete a set task. So it seems that it's effective for core temperature, it's effective for performance in the heat, Again, similar idea. It didn't seem to improve performance in a neutral environment, but it also didn't hurt performance either. So it could still be a benefit one way or the other. Worst case, you are not hurting the athlete's capacity. The last thing kind of we'll talk about here is does hot equals hot? So again, I said at the start, if we know we're going to Tokyo where it's hot and humid, but we cannot replicate that in Finland, can you just adapt the individuals to a dry heat instead, like in a sauna, or if you have a chamber that can't have high humidity, can you just exercise them in the heat, and, but in a low humidity condition, and will they still benefit? So there is only one study that has tested this. This was done in 97 by Barbara Griffon. What they did was they had people walking in a treadmill in four different conditions. They had a control condition, they had a hot and dry condition, they had a, a warm and humid condition, and then they had a condition where there was a really high radiative heat load. So they essentially had heat lamps in the chamber. The end result was the overall wet bulb globe temperature, your global rating of heat stress was the same in all three environments. But again, you had a hot and dry condition, you had a warm and humid condition, you also had a heat lamp condition. So they tested them after two weeks, and then the important thing was they tested their adaptation after two weeks, and then they also tested them in different environments. So 
for example, the solar radiation group also were tested in the hot and dry group. What did they find? They found, first off, that the time course of heat adaptation was the same whether you were adapting to warm and humid, hot and dry, or the heat lamp condition. So they were equally effective after two weeks of adaptation in each of those environments when they were tested in the same environment. The other thing, the really interesting thing that they found when they switched environments after two weeks, they found a similar level of adaptation. So again, the warning is there is only one study out there in the literature that have tested this, but it shows that if you are, what it is suggesting is that, again, if you are going to perform in Tokyo where it's very hot and very humid, you can still ideally adapt. If you cannot replicate those conditions, you can still adapt by just having a, a hot and dry condition instead, for example. Or you can be creative and use solar heat lamps and get the same level of heat stress. This points to the common mechanism. The common mechanism, as I've suggested before, is to drive an individual's core temperature higher than normal and maintain it for about 60 to 90 minutes a day ideally for a week to two weeks. So it doesn't really matter whether you do that with clothing, whether you do that with exercise, with passive exposure to heat, or what environment it is. As long as you get the core temperature up and you keep it up for a while. So to summarize my talk, hopefully I have demonstrated that adaptation is possible, that so you can get away with a four to five day program, but the more you do, the better off you will be. There does seem to be some psychological and perceptual benefits. There may be some tricks you can do to accelerate the rate of improvement, such as with dehydration at the same time as adaptation. And again, the different modalities seem to be effective. The key thing is to get their core temperature higher than normal and keep it higher. The good news is that adaptation, once you are adapted, it doesn't disappear really, really quickly. It disappears gradually and you can just keep that dose going, that adaptation and maintain that adaptation by just having periodic exposures to heat. So the good news is, again, during a tapering block, you don't also need to have them be heat stressed every day. You can just do it with one, two to three bouts over the course of, say, a two-week taper, and that will be enough. So with that, I want to thank you for your time and for attending the talk today. I'm very happy to talk with you outside of this webinar series too. My contact information is there. You can reach me by email, uh, by Twitter, or also by, uh, by my phone. Kitos.